Does it, does it seem like certain sins identified in the Bible are accepted amongst Christians? Do you sense within yourself that it's easy to justify behavior that in the Bible would be categorized as sin? I think relevant questions to our theme uh, of acceptable sins. Of course, we put the question mark there because uh, we're not saying there are acceptable sins. Uh, but it certainly is easy to point the finger at others when we begin to think about sin without being willing to receive correction ourselves. In fact, one of the most misunderstood passages in the Bible is, Judge not lest ye be judged. People use that to say, don't judge me. Uh, but what's interesting, if you think about that, when somebody says to you or to me or to someone, don't judge, what are they doing? They're actually judging. They're judging. So when we say that, we're judging. So that can't be the meaning of the passage. And in fact, if you look at the passage in Matthew chapter 7 that everybody's referring to, when Jesus speaks and says these words, uh, he actually says, take the log out of your own eye in order to help remove the speck out of someone else's eye. So he's not saying, well, just leave the log in your eye and leave the speck in somebody else's eye. No, actually, get the log out of your eye so that you can help get the speck out of someone else's eye. So he's saying help each other. Don't be hypocrites. The point here is that we should not be hypocrites in how we hold each other accountable. Addressing sin in our lives is necessary and we need help from God and we need help from others. We best do that in a posture of humility. Now, last week, Chad started us out on a series of sermons called Acceptable Sins. And I think we're going to be in that series for the entire month. Um, uh, we're moving through the book of James in the process. And clearly, as I said earlier, we are not saying that there are acceptable sins. Um, rather, we're trying to emphasize that there are behaviors and thoughts that we have that sometimes are either deemed less sinful or acceptable as in Christian circles or even, in, even some sins that are simply deemed as acceptable or justifiable. So we're trying to highlight some of those things because that's actually what James is doing through James 1, 2, 3, 4. So uh, Chad and I will hopefully let the Scripture speak to these issues. Uh, as we continue through uh, this sermon series. But Chad started us off well by focusing on temptation. <clears throat> and it's a reminder that we cannot and should not just affirm and nurture our feelings and affections as they may very well be rooted in temptation towards sin. James reminds us in verse 12 that when in chapter 1 verse 12 that when we endure temptation we will receive a crown of life that's a great reward isn't it that crown of life is eternal life of course James also gives wise counsel when in verse 19 in chapter 1 when he says we should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to anger now, wouldn't that solve a lot of problems in our world if we all employed that? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And I'm not pointing any fingers here. That is a word for me today. Often our conflicts result from misunderstandings that leave down very dark has. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to become better listeners and interpreters of each other as we seek for understanding rather than pursue the goal of always being right. James then continues in chapter 1 to give us a hint of what's to come in chapters 2 and 3 at least. In verse 22, he reminds us that we should not just be hearers of the word, but doers of of the word, meaning that we don't get to be arbiters of what's right and wrong. 
So that comes from God, and that comes from His revealed Word. So God defines what's right and wrong. God defines what His purpose is for our lives. So we're not just hearers of the Word, but we're doers of the Word. And then in verse 26 of chapter 1, he talked about the need for controlling our speech. He says we need to bridle our tongue, just like we bridle a horse to bring it under, under control so that it's not dangerous, neither to the rider or to others. And then James expands on this theme in chapter 3. But we're going to focus our time this morning on James chapter 2, verses 1 to 17, which is the, the uh, which was, well, is connected to verse 22, being doers of the word and not just hearers. So I'll be reading from the English Standard Version as usual. The passage will be up on the screen. Again, James chapter 2, verses 1 to 17, you can follow along here or um, if you want to get your phones or uh, your Bible apps or your Bibles out, please follow along. Starting with verse 1, My brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? That could be a sermon all in and of its own. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbors yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not want, if you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning and we recognize that your word is truly a two-edged sword that cuts to the heart, that cuts to the soul. And we thank you, Lord, that often we need that two-edged sword to cut through our own lives and to cut out the things that are just not pleasing to you. We just ask, Lord, that as we spend our time this morning in your word, that you would speak to us and that we'd be changed for your kingdom and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you, have you ever noticed the celebrity culture in America? Is that, is that kind of a thing here in Europe? Do you kind of have 
and I, you know, I don't really feel always very connected to the news and those types of things and news cycles in this part of the world. But you know, in America, we've got this really, really prominent celebrity culture. And I think actually the celebrity culture in America has filtered out to the rest of the world, probably mainly because of Hollywood. Um, but also just because of the size, I guess, of America. I mean, who is it paying attention to the presidential election in America? And that's, I think, all wrapped up in this celebrity culture. So I think it's kind of affected the world. In fact, celebrities are in many ways worshipped in America. It's really sad. It's really, really sad. Th th think about Hollywood. Why in the world do we care who's dating who? Who's just married or who's got, just gotten the latest divorce? I mean, really? Who cares? I, I guess I'm just I'm speaking about my own self, but I just really don't care. Why do we indulge them when it comes to their opinions on topics such as morality and politics? So someone is good at acting or playing sports or is a politician. Because they have fame and money, does that all of a sudden give more credence to the things they believe in a spouse? I guess what I'm trying to do here is I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to take what James is talking about. I'm trying to bring it into today's reality. Obviously, it doesn't mean that we should believe everything that we hear from these celebrities. But because of the platform and because of the culture of celebrity worship, it indeed does influence and impact many. And oftentimes it's not necessarily even explicit. And, and this is because we have a tendency to show partiality, to show preference, especially to the rich and the powerful. Because I think really that deep down that you know, if, if we were to be able to become friends with somebody who's rich or somebody who's powerful, somehow we would then be able to be more rich ourselves or be more powerful ourselves or have more influence. I think that that's deep down in us. And I think that's also why James is specifically addressing that in our passage this morning. You know, I think the enticement of power and money is what has created this culture. And we too are susceptible to its trappings. James is reminding us not to show partiality. In fact, showing partiality, he says, is a sin. I'm not saying it's a sin. James is saying it's a sin. The example James gives is how we treat the rich man as compared to how we might treat a poor man. The rich man has means. The rich man can tithe well, is probably dressed well, is clean, smells nice, probably is articulate, and we could go on and on. It could also mean that the rich man expects to be treat, treated a certain way. On the other hand, the poor man has no money, appears to offer very little, has no influence, and might not be the cleanest of individuals. I can assure you that uh, as I have wor worked in the church, I have been in a fair number of situations where homeless people have shown up to church events or worship services smelling like they've slept in their own ex excrement or like they've taken a shower in beer. That's happened a number of times. But, you know, most of the time we aren't talking about those extreme situations. The reality is, is that we can end up creating a caste system in the church, even if it isn't explicit, like we see in societies like India. I was trying to think of some other places because I just want to say, well, it's all on India. I mean, you know, maybe apartheid that we saw in South Africa that of years ago, or maybe even our modern day caste system in America is this celebrity culture. Certain people are on the top of the caste system, and some people are on the bottom. So do we do that in our church? Well, that's really dividing people, isn't it? I mean, that's what that is. We're divided. We're judging people and dividing them based on their circumstances. Well, today, there are so many ways in which we divide ourselves in society. 
I mean, most recently it's been through something called anti-racism. Has anybody ever heard of anti-racism? Nobody's, nobody's, okay, a couple of people have heard of it. Well, wouldn't you think that anti-racism would be like, hey, we're all just against racism. That's actually not the definition of anti-racism. It's actually um, a, an ideology uh, where the majority group that is considered the oppressors oppress the minorities and therefore anti-racism is actually about oppressing the oppressor so it's it's just reverse discrimination it's reverse racism you would think that anti-racism would be something we could all get on board with but if you look closely at it it's about dividing people but anti-racism is pure and simple racism itself as an ideology and based on discrimination against whatever racial group is the majority and in power. Divisiveness can also be seen through some of the things that are going on with sexual identity. And we are told that we have to agree and affirm these identities. Otherwise, we are bigoted, homophobic, and transphobic. And in reality, these terms are rendered meaningless because they are overused in used incorrectly. A phobia is actually a fear of something. I have a fear of heights. That means I have acrophobia. And I can assure you, can assure you that that's genuine and Jen can attest to it. Of course, these, these, these terms that are thrown, thrown around are meant to slander another and to keep those who don't agree with the ide ideology silent. It's about dividing people. It's about judgment. But here's the problem. So I, I, can, I can talk about these, these things and point the finger. I, it's not actually meant to completely point the finger. We don't tend to react well to all of what's going on in the world. And that's where our focus should be as a church. As these things that, that are going on around us, how, how, how do we engage? How do, how do we as a church engage? There are huge segments of the church that are capitulating to these ideological influences on the one hand, but on the other hand, we have become so jaded by public discourse that we actually would balk at the idea of what we might call adversaries participating in our community. And, and I say adversaries to rom actually to remind us that whoever these people are, are not actually our adversaries. The people aren't. I, I, uh, we keep that designation solely to Satan. He's the adversary. Satan is the adversary. Instead, these are the very people who are lost and in need of, sa of the saving grace of Jesus who need who will be set free from sin and guilt when they find saving grace in Jesus. So our goal is not to win arguments. Our goal is to win the hearts of the lost, whether they are rich or poor, whether they are white or black, whether they're young or old, whether they're men or women, whether they're gay or straight. Our job and commission is to love our neighbor. That's what we're reminded of this morning by James. And guess what? When we do that, our neighbor benefits. And guess what? We also benefit with them and our communities benefit. And most of all, the kingdom of God benefits. Why? It's because it's because it is through those relationships that our, that our neighbors, that we share our lives and our faith with, might actually have the opportunity to come to faith in Jesus. Can God begin to work through us to change hearts? And when a heart changes, so does the mind. The mind always follows the heart. You know, James sums up chapter 2 with this simple sentence that is really true. So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. We are to be reminded that if faith does not produce fruit, then that faith isn't alive. James' focus is on this contrast between the treatment of the rich and the poor. 
But I think that we can extend this truth out to many aspects of our lives. But his focus is on the rich and the poor, so much so that the sentence before verse 17, he gives an example of someone um, with means um, patting someone on the back and wishing them the blessing of God when there is an opportunity to help them in their material need. While this is a good example for us to define what James means when he says faith without works is dead, it's important for us to expand our understanding of what works looks like when we have a vibrant and f living faith in Jesus. Showing partiality tends to be a sin of omission. And it is easy to not only justify, but to hide. Granted, we live in an affluent society, so maybe, uh, maybe this rich-poor thing isn't quite as big of a deal here. Maybe it is. I believe we as a church, we can be inclusive in the best way possible. Since the gospel is the most inclusive bit of good news the world has ever heard. Jesus invites all sinners to receive forgiveness of sins through his shed blood on the cross and to have a reconciled relationship with God. No one is excluded unless they exclude themselves. Isn't that an encouraging reminder to us this morning? Let's pray together. Lord, we, um, we come to you this morning, um, and may, maybe some of, some of us come to you this morning uh, with a need to, uh, to seek forgiveness. Um, I know that when we examine our lives and, and we think about sins of omission or, or attitudes or, or, or things um, that don't necessarily seem to have much of an outward expression. Um, Lord, we, we read in your scripture over and over again that, that the thought life um, is, is something that you deeply care about. And, uh, and, and, and we pray, Lord, that uh, you would continue to transfer our minds. We're reminded in Romans chapter 12 of what Paul says, that, that our minds... We need a renewal. We re need a renewal from the Holy Spirit to transform our minds to Christ-likeness. And, and that's our endeavor, Lord, each and every day. We thank you, Lord, that you don't withhold your blessings from us. Um, every good thing comes from the Lord of light. We're reminded in James chapter 1 of that and by Chad this morning. So every good thing does come from you. And we just pray, Lord, that you would help us. Um, some of these topics are heavy um, and, and difficult to deal with. We live in a complex world, uh, but, but still you're on your throne. Um, still you uh, are a God who can work through and, and, and deal with the complexity. Um, and you can help us navigate all of that complexity. Help us to be a community that's truly, not only loving to each other, but, but really does truly love our neighbors and welcomes them into fellowship. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.